covered on this computer. Oh, great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Graduate Online Combinatorics Colloquium. Today, we are delighted to have George Nasser come to a talk about a combinatorial formula for Kajan Lustig polynomials of sparse paving matroids. Before he begins his talk, we just want to remind you of the three guiding principles of the Graduate Online Combinatorics Coll Colloquium. So, we are all learning, everyone has something to contribute. And no one has all the answers. So as George gives his talk, we invite you to ask questions, either by unmuting yourself or asking them in the chat. Um, Andres and I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, we can interrupt George if he doesn't see them. OK. Anything else I should add before we start? Great. Take it away. All right. Thank you, organizers, for the invitation. It's cool to get to talk about some stuff that I've worked on for my own research. Um, so this is joint work with my advisors, Kyung Young Lee and Jamie Radcliffe. <clears throat> um, so I kind of just want to give a brief outline as to what I'm going to do for this talk. So I, I want to start with the, the classical theory for Kajdan Lustig polynomials and then kind of talk about how the theory got generalized very briefly before I go into the main topic of this um, talk, which is kajdan lustig theory for matroids. And then I want to provide some combinatorial formulas that I discovered and then give some future directions of this stuff. So let's talk about classical stuff. So, so to talk about that, I need to introduce Coxeter groups. So Coxeter groups are just a group with the following presentation. Um, you guys can see my mouse cur cursor, yeah? All right, I'll just use that to point out the screen, I guess. So you've got a bunch of uh, generators, and the relations have this form, where if the two um, uh, parameters here are the same, you get one, and otherwise the values can be anything in here. Infinity means that there is no relation between those two um, generators. Um, and you can induce an, an, a partial order called the Bruja order on these elements. And basically, x is smaller than y if a reduced word for z contains a reduced word for x as a substring. So the words reduced means, you know, it, with these relations, it's possible that you can, like, things kind of simplify down. And so a reduced word is as simple as possible. I'm not going to worry too much about the details here because I'm not really focusing on Coxeter groups, but just to give you an idea, here is um, a Coxeter group with the Bruja ordering. So you have the identity element. I guess should have maybe made this one since I put a one up here, but oh well. Um, I've got that. I've got my two relators. And then there are two ways to kind of have length two. Um, um, words in this group. And then it turns out that using the relation right here that we have that these length three words are the same. And so the, the, the edges here tell you that S1 is less than S1, S2 because S1 kind of appears as a subword in there. And then likewise over here for S2 and then going on. Okay. So you can kind of almost think about it as containment. So that's kind of what Bruja order does on the Coxer group. Um, and so Kajdan and Lustig, um, we're studying a specific type of algebra corresponding to Coxeter groups and came up with these polynomials, P index PXZ for X less than or equal to Z in the Coxeter group. And they satisfy the following three axioms. So if x and z are the same, you just make the polynomial equal to 1. Um, you have a condition on the degree of the polynomial to be less than, strictly less than, the length of z minus the length of x over 2. So the length of z and x is just how, effectively, it's how long the word is. More concretely, you take a reduced version of the word and you see how many um, letters are in it or how many um, how many generators make up that, that word. Um, and then finally, you have this crazy funky looking uh, summation. Um, so just to talk through it, I think everything over here is mostly okay because it's just using T 
to some power times p of t inverse. Over here, there's some mystery going on. So first, this little interval right here, um, that just is all the elements between x and z in the Bruja order on the lattice on the prior page, including x and z. So this is a sum ranging all of, over all of these. And so here we have this new polynomial guy called Rxy. I'm not gonna say much about that other than it's a polynomial with integer coefficients like p. Um, one thing I do wanna point out though, that if you take in this sum, if you take y to be equal to x, then you have Rxx times pxz. And it, Rx, y has the property that Rxx equals one. So in this sum, you actually recover this polynomial and it ends up giving you a recursive definition for um, uh, these polynomials, recursive in, with respect to the length of, or the, the, the kind of like the, the, the size of this interval, right? So if, if y is bigger than x, the distance between y and z, you can think of that as being smaller. Um, another thing to note is that if I was to subtract that pxz term over here, notice because the degree of pxz is strictly less than half of this guy, and I'm raising t to that same power, the terms of all of this are kind of like the kind of like the flipped version of the coefficients for pxz. It basically like changes the order of the coefficients that they appear in. Um, the the degree of the terms are of course not the same, but um, yeah. Okay, so that's that's kind of some things I want to say there. I realize that I'm not giving a ton of intuition for this definition, and and that's okay. This is more to set up things much later on. Um, so this polynomial is called the kajdan lustig polynomial, and these mysterious R po Rxz polynomials that I didn't really talk about are referred to as R polynomials. Um, so as I said, um, kajdan and lustig were studying um, something called the Hecke algebra. Effectively, the coefficients of these polynomials um, ended up encoding a change of basis matrix for this algebra. So there's like a canonical basis that you can take for the algebra. And then there's this like interesting one and this, these polynomials encoded. And, and much to their surprise, or much to mathematicians' surprise, the coefficients of these polynomials are non-negative. So this was proven fairly recently, even though Kajdan and Lustig conjectured this all the way back when they first were talking about it. Um, I will say that Kajdan and Lustig did already prove non-negativity in the special case when the Coxer group is known as a while group. I won't say much about that other than while groups generally have very geometric interpretations um, with respect to the Coxeter group families. Um, okay. So that's effectively all I wanted to say about the classical theory, just saying like where the kajdan lustig theory comes from and kind of what these polynomials look like. I wanna now talk about the, the more general theory, but the more general theory could be a whole talk on its own. So I just wanna give like a, like, a, like a very like schematic, like how do you go from the classical to the general theory? So I'm making this table, um, so the Bruja order, so, so what are some components of the uh, classical theory? We have this Bruja order on W that gave us a poset structure on the Coxeter group elements. We had this length function that I mentioned. So remember the length is like the number of elements that make up your word, specifically a reduced word. We had these mysterious R polynomials that I didn't really define, and then we have these KL polynomials. So this is how things generalize. So for the general theory, instead of the Bruja order on W, we just have a post set with two special properties. The first property is that, um, if you remember, I had these intervals X to Z. Those inter so those things are you know, all the elements that are between X and Z, including X and Z. 
um, the first property you need for the POSA is for it to be locally finite. That says that the intervals are finite. The other property comes from the generalization of the length function, which is a weak rank function. So if you've ever thought about rank for a post set, it's basically what you think it is. Imagine drawing a Hasse diagram for a post set and the rank zero elements are the one on the bottom. The ones above that are rank one, above that is rank two. And if you can do this in a way that makes sense where you don't cause any problems assigning values to um, elements, you have a ranked post set. And that's the second property you need for that post set. Okay. Another thing I want to comment on, and if you remember, maybe it's best to go back to the uh, that first slide. Um, you can think so. This guy has length zero. These guys here have length one, length two, and length three. And so you can kind of think of that as a as a rank, right? Ranks are going up level by level by one each time. That's the intuition for what we want ranks to do. Okay, so instead of these R polynomials, we have these things called P kernels. Unfortunate notation here, the R here refers to the fact that the letter R is used to define them, and here the P is used to the fact, is used for the fact that the post set is P. So there's not really a correlation there. Um, again, much like with these R polynomials, I'm going to leave these P kernels as kind of this mysterious black box thing. And then instead of a KL polynomial, we have KLS polynomials. The S stands for Stanley. So where the general theory comes in is Stanley was studying um, these polynomials for uh, polytopes called G polynomials. And he realized that that combinatorics that kind of um, the definition for the kajdan lustig polynomial that I showed you, um, you can kind of recover these polynomials he was studying using similar combinatorics, using a different poset, using a different rank function, using a different p kernel. And so he's like, hey, why? There's nothing special about this. It was special to kajdan and lustig because of the algebra, but combinatorially you could abstract so much more. And so now there's kind of like interesting questions that we can look into about this general theory specifically like okay if we talk about coxeter groups we kind of understand that theory fairly well what happens if we use different structures and so one of those structures that is of recent research interest um, are matroids so I kind of want to now talk a little bit about matroids and talk about how we get the kajdan lustig polynomials for matroids. So um, let's talk about what a matroid is. Um, for those that know what matroids are, there are like a thousand ways to define a matroid. So here is one. Um, this is my favorite one just because of the intuition that comes with it. Um, so we start with a finite set and we have this script I be a subset of the power set of E. And it has the following conditions, the empty sets in it. Um, condition two basically says it's a down set. If I have a subset of a set that's in script I, then I must also be in script I. Note that conditions one and two are equivalent to being a simplicial complex. The added bonus is condition three, which says that if I've got two elements of my script I and one is bigger than the other, then I can take an element of the bigger one, add it to the smaller one, and I still land back in I. Keyword here is exists, not for all, okay? So these elements of script I are called independent, and the pair EI is a matroid. So, so now that I've used the word independent, if you restudy this condition here, this should kind of remind you of the exchange relation you may have learned for linearly independent sets in um, linear algebra. Um, and then another thing I want to say is a maximal independent set is called a basis. Or the maximal independent sets are called bases, so singular is basis. Um, and that also kind of conforms with what we think about in linear algebra. We know a maximal independent set is, we, we call those things bases, and once you make them any bigger, they are no longer linearly independent. Okay, so with that in mind, it's clear that there's a lot of connections between matroids and linear algebra, and so I wanted to like do a few examples in case people haven't seen matroids before, just because I think, uh, you know, definitions are fine and dandy, but they don't provide a lot of intuition all the time. So let's start with 
one that relates to linear algebra directly. So let's take your ground set E to be the columns of a matrix over some field K and take I to be um, the subsets of the columns that are linearly independent over your field. This gives you a matroid and we call it a representable matroid. The word representable is kind of saying that it represents something and what does it represent? It ends up representing things called hyperplane arrangements. And that's, if you remember earlier on, I said that the while groups are kind of like the geometric version of Coxeter groups. That's kind of the synonymous thing here. Representable matroids are like the geometric matroids. And so just for an example, here's my matrix here and I've labeled the columns C1, 2, 3. And so to find the independent sets, we just take all subsets of the columns that are independent, empty sets tautologically independent. Each single column on its own should be independent, right? But now when you get pairs of things, it gets interesting. You'll notice that C2 is a scalar multiple of C1, hence the pair is not linearly independent. But the other possible pairs of columns are linearly independent. And then of course, the all three can't be linearly independent because the pair C1, C2 is not, okay? So that's a representable matroid structure, but there are other ways to get matroids that aren't arising in linear algebra. Um, if you take the edges of a simple graph, no loops or double edges, um, and you take script I to be the acyclic subgraphs of G, that gives rise to a matroid and we call those matroids graphic matroids. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So the bases here are the spanning forests or if you have a connected graph, spanning trees. On the previous page, the bases are what you expect them to be. They're like bases in the traditional sense. In this case, they would be bases of the column space of your matrix. And so here you, you know that the bases of this matroid are these two um, sets there. Okay, so you might be wondering why I'm like worrying about reminding you about bases and it's gonna be for this next example. So if you go to the title of my talk, I specify sparse paving matroids. And so that's what I'd like to specify next. So pick a non-negative integer D and let B be a collection of D subsets of E. So this notation here is the collection of sets of E of size D. And I'm, make, I'm picking this D so that every pair of elements in the complement has this symmetric difference condition. So symmetric difference is the things in C not in C prime and the things in C prime not in C. Um, and now I'll take I to be the subsets of the elements of script B. And this will give rise to a sparse paving matroid. So I wanna make a couple comments here. Um, because I think the last two examples have some kind of very practical geometric interpret, or not geometric, but like, it's clear like what they're being connected to. And here I just kind of have this wonky symmetric difference condition on the complements of these, um, of these elements. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that um, for those that know more matroid theory, um, there are things called circuits and things called hyperplanes and matroid theory. And a sparse paving matroid is a matroid who's where the complement of the bases are the circuit hyperplanes of the matroid. There's a little bit there to argue. Um, the other thing I want to say is that remember that the bases are the maximal independent sets. We'll note that by construction of I, the members of script B are called a basis, or the members of script B are the bases of the matroid. And so this kind of shows you how you can actually specify bases first and then get a matroid out of that. So that gives you another way to form a definition for a matroid. Obviously there's more to it than just that, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, so the reason I'm picking this version of the definition for sparse paving matroid mostly is because it's the easiest one to write down, but also it kind of lends itself to some interesting um, combinatorial arguments. The other thing I want to say is if you take B to be the entire collection of subsets of E of size D, you get 
something called a uniform matroid. And so in this matroid, all the sets of size D or smaller are independent. Okay, so those are lots of examples of matroids and what matroids are. And so now I kind of want to connect the dots with the classical theory and show how we get Kajdan-Lustig theory, but for matroids instead of classical theory. And I'll use this kind of like general theory framework that I've set up earlier on in the talk. So first, I need to find this new post set that's going to um, be of importance. And um, to do that, I'm going to also talk about the rank function at the same time. And so suppose you have a matroid. A subset of the ground set has the following rank. So we define the rank to be the, effectively this is the largest independent set that is contained in you, contained in F. So if F is itself independent, then its cardinality is its rank. But you could have a set that's not independent, in which case you take the rank to be um, the largest independent set inside of it. And then when you're maximal with respect to your rank, that is, no matter what elements you add to a set, it doesn't change. Or, sorry, no matter what element you, let me start over. If you're maximal with respect to your rank, that is, if there is a way to add an element <laughs> to you that increases your rank, then you are called flat. That means like I can't really do any better. Um, and so this gives rise to a lattice of flats ordered by inclusion. So instead of the Bruja order on the elements of the Coxeter group, we're going to look at the flats for a matroid and order them by inclusion. And so taking this representable matroid example I did earlier, um, the flats are not too bad to describe. So the empty set's a flat because if I I can add C1, C2, or C3 to the empty set, and that makes each of those are independent, and so that would increase the rank. So the empty set's maximal with respect to the rank. Likewise, C3 is flat, because if I add C1 or C2, those are both linearly independent with C3, and so that also increases the rank from one to two. And so far, both of the empty set and C3 are independent sets. But not all flats are independent. For example, C1, C2 is a flat. And it's rank 1 because C1 and C2 form a linearly dependent set, but any one of them is a linearly independent set. And if I was to add C3 to the mix, I get, I get a potentially larger independent set. Remember, C1, C3 is independent, so is C2 and C3. So, so this is maximal with respect to the rank, because if I add C3, I'll create a bigger independent set inside of it. And then it is always true that the ground set is maximal with respect to rank, because I can't make the ground set any bigger. Um, and of course, the rank of this guy here is 2, for similar reasons that I described down here, the largest independent set inside that collection is two. Okay, so that's the lattice of flats and the rank for that. All right, so those are the first two things. We now need a p-kernel thing, and much like with the R polynomial, I'm not going to go into many details about it. Um, I will say what it is. It's the characteristic function on the lattice of flats for the matroid. So if you know what the characteristic function is, great. If not, don't worry about it. It's not the most important thing. This mu right here is, the, is called the Mobius function on L. It has some special properties. Um, you can also, if you know things about um, the incidence algebra for a matroid, you can also recover the characteristic function via those means as well. Um, so I just wanted to put this here mostly for people that know what it is, but if not, again, it's, it's not the most important part of this talk. So that's what's going to replace the R polynomials. And so now all we have to do is define what our kajdan lustig stanley uh, polynomials will be in this case. And so this definition is given by Elias Proudfoot and Wakefield in 2016. So this is fairly new, newly being researched. 
Um, so if you have a matroid, we define the kajdan lustig polynomial for a matroid, denoted PM of T, given by the following conditions. So if the rank of E is zero, that is, if there are no independent sets of size bigger than zero, that means the empty set's the only independent set, then just define the KL polynomial to be one. We have a condition on the degree of the, excuse me, um, of the polynomials, which is to be less, strictly less than half of the rank. And then we have this funky looking sum thing. So this L, remember, is the lattice of flats for the matroid. Um, I don't know why I'm saying remember. I never really said it out loud. It was on slides, though. But um, L is the lattice of flats. Um, I have not defined this M super F, M sub F yet. The way to think about these are matroids that you get by doing the following to the lattice of flats. M super F says, look at the lattice of flats, take F in that lattice of flats and look at everything that's below F. That lattice of flats corresponds to a new matroid and that's what M super F is. Likewise, M sub F is look at F, look at everything above F and um, And that corresponds to the lattice of flats of a different matroid. Galen, did you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Remind me, is your lattice of flats organized by like inclusion or reverse inclusion? Oh no, inclusion, normal okay. inclusion. Yeah. Yeah, so empty sets on the bottom and the ground sets at the top. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess to Galen's comment, I will remark that sometimes these things are denoted in like the opposite way. The reason that this notation is good is if you have M super G sub F, that means it's everything between F and G, like bottom to top. And that's why that notation is like nice and useful. Um, originally, the authors actually had, the authors of this paper actually defined it the opposite only to realize that matroid theorists do it the way I have it here. So they had to like change their notation in a later paper. Um, okay, cool. So that's one thing I wanted to say. Another thing I wanted to say is, um, remember that the, uh, for, so remember on previous example, on the previous example, the empty set was a, um, was a flat. Um, for the matroids that I'm interested in, the independent set will always be a flat. And so the empty set will always appear in the sum. And um, so in that case, M super F is the matroid corresponding to the lattice of flats where everything is below the empty set or including the empty set. So it's just the empty set. And so you just get kind of like the tautological matroid in that case, and you can show that the characteristic function in that case is just one. On the other hand, M sub empty set corresponds to the lattice of flats where everything's above the empty set, which is, and including the empty set, which is everything. So M sub empty sets actually M. And so again, you get P sub M appearing in this sum. And so if you subtract that over to the other side, you again get a recursive definition for these kajdan lustig polynomials, just like we did in the Coxeter case. And so this does actually mean that a computer can compute these kajdan lustig polynomials. Um, okay, and so with these spaces in between the lines, what I wanted to do is kind of contrast this definition for kajdan lustig polynomials with the originals for the classical version. So remember I had if P, X, Z, if X and Z are the same in the Coxeter group, then the classical kajdan lustig polynomial is one. Um, we had this similar looking uh, degree condition. It's a little different, right? We have this difference going on, but it's still strictly less than something divided by two. 
And then we still had this kind of similar crazy looking summation going on. So one question that should be kind of floating around is why is it in the classical example we bother to specify an X and a Z in the Coxeter group? Why aren't we specifying what would be the corresponding two flats in the lattice of flats? And the reason for that is that any interval in the lattice of flats is actually the lattice of flats for another matroid. That is not the synonymous version for that is not true for Coxeter groups. An interval in a Coxeter group in the and sorry, using the Bruja order does not correspond to another Coxeter group, probably not even a group, if you really think about it. Um, and so it is not necessary to specify the intervals for the Kajdamustic polynomials because understanding them for all matroids is equivalent to understanding them for every interval, and that's not the same in the Coxeter theory. So in that way, the, the matroid version of Kajdamustic theory is actually a little cleaner and a, a little nicer. Um, so yeah, okay, are there other things I... I'm kind of like flying through this. Are there questions? Are we okay? Maybe I've already gone too fast for questions. <laughs> People are like, we're gone. <laughs> All right. Hey, hey George, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, yes. So, in the case of matroids, these the, the corresponding thing to the R polynomial is the characteristic polynomial. That's right. Is in the case of uh, wild groups, the R polynomial is related to the to the characteristic polynomial of the corresponding hyperplane arrangement. That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. But I completely see why you would expect that <laughs> for wild groups. Yeah, I don't, I don't actually know the, the answer to that. Sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. That's okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question, though. Um, other questions I possibly don't know the answer to. <laughs> cool. Great. Um, okay, are there other things I want to say about this definition? Um, I guess, I guess I'll comment on the thing that I commented on earlier. So I mentioned that the P sub M shows up in this sum when you take F to be the empty set. And so this guy, again, is like the coefficients are in the flipped order, but also because it's strictly less than half, there's no overlap in um, the, uh, the terms. All of these terms will be strictly bigger than half of the rank of the matroid. Or, um, sorry, the, uh, the degree of each monomial showing up in here is strictly larger than half of the matroid. And then the opposite's true for um, the original polynomial. OK. So. That's kajdan lustig theory for matroids. And if you recall at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned for the Coxeter theory, there was this phenomenon that was discovered in 2014 that uh, the coefficients are positive or non-negative. And the same thing is conjectured to be true for these polynomials. And in fact, it's already been proven by the original authors when M's a representable matroid. So again, remember, Representable is kind of like that geometric version of matroids. And if you recall, I mentioned that uh, Kajdan and Lustig originally proved um, the non-negativity of the coefficients for the geometric version of the Coxeter group. So this is like kind of a common thing where the geometric versions like no problem. And then the non-geometric versions like a lot harder. <laughs> um, and so since this result has come out, um, there have been a lot of, so, so the, uh, this showing this result um, amounts to showing that the Kajdan-Lustig polynomial for matroids can be written of the, 
basically it can be written as in a way so that the coefficients are the dimension of some algebraic thing. Um, so it's not, there's not really like an interesting common, or there's not an explicit formula for these things. If you actually wanted to compute these coefficients, it's not very easy given what they proved. So since then, lots of people have been focusing on specific classes and trying to show um, the non-negativity in those special cases by just producing explicit formulas. So again, we already know the non-negativity, but having an explicit formula is nice. It's even nicer if you can get a combinatorial interpretation for the coefficients. Um, but the bad news is that everything they people have done have been for representable matroids. And sadly, there aren't very many of them. So if m sub n is the number of matroids on a ground set of size n, and kn is the number of representable matroids on that same size ground set, asymptotically, there, there are none. That is, the ratio converges to zero. So, you know, it's like not the worst thing. It just says that we've basically don't know what most of these kajdan lustig polynomials really look like. However, a few years back, there was a somewhat related version of this theorem proved for sparse paving matroids. And it looks like this. So take all the same stuff, replace um, representable with sparse paving, and everything in blue is kind of like the new stuff. And so what we see is we, if you will, this is kind of like slang that I'm making up, but logarithmically, almost all matroids are sparse paving. Um, and so you can use this to deduce that if you were to get rid of the logarithms here, that it would not equal zero. In other words, unlike representable matroids, sparse paving matroids are, unlike their name, not very sparse as the ground set gets larger and larger and larger, we actually expect to see a relevant number of sparse paving matroids as the ground set goes, gets larger. And so my result is showing that kajdan lustig polynomials for sparse paving matroids are non-negative, or the coefficients are non-negative, which is cool because there are actually a lot more sparse paving matroids than representable matroids. And what's, what's what makes me really excited about the results is that I kind of have a semi-combinatorial interpretation for these coefficients. So to do that, we're going to talk about Tableau. Finally, something fun to play with, <laughs> not these crazy looking sums. <laughs> um, okay, so I have like two little fun skew Tableau shapes here. I've labeled some dimensions on both of them. Basically, the game you play here is equivalent to what you do with standard Young Tableau. You let the columns, you fill in the columns and rows so that they increase going down, increase going right, um, and that's strictly increasing, so there's no repetition in numbers, and also you use the smallest available numbers. So the smallest value is a one, and the largest is the number of squares appearing. So in this specific case, there are actually 13 squares. So the numbers 1 through 13 show up in here. And all such fillings of this, excuse me, of this shape is denoted by this collection. Okay. There is a special collection that I'll denote. So I'll call these Skype, and these guys are called Skype bar. Um, and the difference between these two, mainly one main difference is there's no like tail going on down here. So I only really depend on I and B in this case. Another condition is that I kind of fix the location of one. A priori, since the columns and rows increase, one can only be in this corner or at the very, very top right here. So there weren't many choices to begin with. Okay, so just to kind of help solidify ideas. Those are two elements of these two sets. So columns and rows are increasing and I'm using every possible number between one and the number of positions in those squares. 
George, I have a quick question, which is for the, the overline one. I think it also is the non-overline one. It seems like you don't have enough parameters. How do you know, how, like, the multiplicity of the long rows? So, like, are you fixing that there's always two of the long rows? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I know. It's, it's weird because, like, these columns are, like, abstract or, like, generally as long as they need to be, but the middle section really is just two. Aha. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. I, that is a very important thing that I always forget to mention. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird how specific these tableaus really are in shape. It really is this overlap of size two, and then these legs go as far as they want to be and can be as far apart as they need to be. Any other questions about these tableaus? Great. OK, so just a reminder. These are our sparse paving matroids. Remember, I remember B ends up script B ends up being the basis for your matroid, and you pick it so that its complement has the symmetric difference condition. Um, oh, I should actually mention this. It's worth noting this um, because these sets have a, because the elements here will have the same size. They all have size D. The symmetric difference has to be even. In particular. It has to be at least two if they're distinct. So I'm really here saying it's like, it's the second smallest possible condition for that. And I, I just think it's like worth knowing that that's really what, how not constrained the condition is, um, if you see it like that. All right, and now for the main results. So there's some notation defined first. So suppose we have a sparse paving matroid where the ground set is is has this size so remember the ground set so i'm using the same notation as up here the ground set will clearly have size at least d because i'm picking d subsets of e and so m's just the gap um and let rho be the size of the complement of script b then the ith coefficient for the kajdan lustig polynomial is given by this formula so Lowercase s here tells you its size instead of a set. So that's notation that I like to use. So the size, the number of tableaus with these dimensions minus rho times the number of bar tableaus with those dimensions. Oh no, I put a b here. I even checked my slides. This should be d minus 2i plus 1. Um, that ends up being the coefficients. And moreover, this formula is positive. Yay! So um, some things to say here. First, I want to comment that proving the positivity of this thing was a huge pain. It was not fun. I basically just used a lot of calculus tricks, <laughs> showing things are finding an initial value and then showing it's increasing, stuff that you do in Calc 1, basically. <laughs> and the way I did that is by finding a natural bound on the size of the complement, rho, and also finding some nice formulas for Skype and Skype bar. Um, but this isn't quite like that. And while, while it's, it's nice that this formula is positive, it's better if you can get combinatorial things, right? Like that would be really cool. And so there's one natural way to see how to get a combinatorial interpretation here. And it's to let rho be zero, because if rho is zero, then literally your ith coefficient is just the number of these tableaus. And that's pretty cool. And we can accomplish that by taking b to be the entire collection e choose d. And in that case, we actually get this result. And furthermore, in that case, as I referred to earlier, M's a special matroid called a uniform matroid. So up until this point, there were lots of examples of formulas given for uniform matroids. Uniform matroids are kind of like the like the first matroid to try something on because of how nice and understandable they are. And so people have found lots of formulas for them, but none of them were combinatorial. So that's what I'm like really proud of with this result is that I have a combinatorial way to describe the coefficients. Um, 
and I can do a little bit better. So if I take this set difference here to be a disjoint family, that does allow me to control the size of row enough to get the following combinatorial interpretation. So now I have skite sub row and the set skite sub row is the sub collection of tableaus satisfying at least one of these three conditions right here. So what the conditions say are maybe not so important, but I just wanted to say, look, you, it's pretty easy to describe them, either the top entry of the rightmost columns one or this or that. They're not hard to describe. And so the real content of this corollary is actually showing that the number of these tableaus that are described by this is the same as this guy, this formula that we saw on the prior page. And effectively, all, your, all I really do is construct row copies of Skype bar that live inside here and take their complement, and they happen to be described by this. So it's a direct combinatorial proof, which is nice. Um, so in very special cases of sparse paving matroids, I have some pretty interesting combinatorial interpretation, but a very natural future direction is to do this for all sparse paving matroids. I would love to like see a way to like ex to always describe the coefficients as some condition on the tableaus. I think that would be really cool. Um, but other things you could ask is, are these tableaus really specific to sparse paving matroids? Is there a way to get it to describe all matroids? Um, so those are like kind of like the two big questions that I have that are like directly related to what I'm doing. But there are a lot of other questions in this area that people are interested in. Um, so there is a question of, of real rootedness. Specifically, these polynomials are conjectured to have negative real roots, um, which is weird because like I never really thought about, you wouldn't like, we were focusing on the coefficients so much, but actually thinking about the roots could also be of interest here. And so my curiosity is, does the formula I have make this any easier or harder? Real rootedness is really hard though. Um, special cases of that include log concavity and unimodality. I won't say much about those. I can kind of speak about those if people have questions about those. Um, but um, those are basically some, more or less those are things implied by real rootedness. So if you can prove those, then maybe the original thing's true. And then the final other question is, you know, this is like the only, you know, besides what um, Stanley was studying, this has been the only other KLS theory that has been developed. But as long as you have some kind of post set, some notion of rank, the hard part is finding these mysterious P kernels slash R polynomials. But if you can find those, you can develop a new theory. And I think the kind of interesting part of this theory is this idea that maybe these polynomials always have positive coefficients for some reason. And I find that kind of surprising and fascinating. And I'd like to see more examples of these um, polynomials and see people prove more things about the positivity of these coefficients because I'm just fascinated to know if it is even reasonably true. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's everything. Thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Let's give George a round of applause. You can either do reactions or uh, you can unmute yourself and clap. So I think there's one question that I see in the chat. Um, oh, yeah. I guess Mario, you can unmute yourself and ask it if you'd like. Sure. I was just wondering if you can tell us something about why that specific shape of skew tableau arises. That's the best question to ask. Um, it's kind of it's kind of still a mystery to even me. Basically, the the thing that happened is um, in the in the original paper where these authors defined these um, polynomials for matroids. Um, they had a, 
it's been so long since I've thought about it now. They basically had this recursive definite recursive formula for the coefficients that they found just in terms of just like without really referring to the like matroid stuff itself. They just found a way to describe things with binomial coefficients. Um, and they were like really nasty looking formulas, but my advisor was looking at it and he was like, I think these are actually describing a certain family of strings. And these strings had A1s, two copies of a few other numbers, and then B copies of the final number. And they had some interesting relation between them. And those were really hard to work with, but eventually we found a way to convert that string property into a property on Tableau's. Um, so that was kind of like the path. It was basically, we found these binomials, we kind of guessed what they were trying to count not really being sure. And then we found a formula for these tableaus and it just worked out. <laughs> That's really cool, thanks. Yeah. I have two questions, yes. uh, George. One is more of a clarifying question. So we care, and by we I mean you, <laughs> uh, about the, the coefficients being positive or non-negative because there's a hope that they're counting something, right? I think this is, or or, or am I just not understanding why we care about positivity? Honestly, it's not even clear to me why Kajdan and Lustig really cared about positivity other than they're like, I think it's true. Um, I personally do think they are counting something. And my hope is actually as much as I, as much as I, uh, as much as I love these tableaus and they're fun to count, I actually want to believe that these coefficients are counting something in the matroid mm -hmm. lattice structure because I mean let's face it this definition is like the worst thing ever um, <laughs> but I'm hoping that there is like a cool combinatorial way to understand what these coefficients are doing and maybe there's I mean it'd be ridiculous to show this for the general theory but yeah. But yeah, um, I, I basically suspect that they're always counting something and I'd like to know what it is they're counting and eventually why is it mm -hmm. that that's what they're counting. My second question was, so you mentioned that Stanley was like thinking about this with like from a polytope kind of thing and then yeah. you've been doing this stuff for matroids. Is there a connection between like the matroid polytope and any of this or has anybody explored that at all? Oh, I actually don't know anything about the matroid polytope. Is there an easy description of the matroid polytope? It, what, is there an easy description of the matroid polytope? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think Mario probably knows more about this than, than I do, but uh, what is it like the, the matroid polytope is the convex hull of indicator vectors that come from the set of bases. Okay, yeah. uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I had that question too. Well, I, I was like trying to think about that too during it, but I, I think if I remember correctly, like there's not really a good interpretation yet of like how you can get the flats from the matroid polytope. I might be wrong about that, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, yeah, so that's a good question that I, I was wondering too. Yeah, so my gut instinct is to say no without actually knowing the answer to the question really. And the reason my answer is no is just because in the in Stanley's, so remember, whenever you develop a new version of the theory, you kind of have to specify these four things. Um, and what Stanley defines as his rank function for his polystope, polytope stuff is quite different. <laughs> in particular, um, the rank function in his case ends up actually being a polynomial, not a number, which is kind of weird to think about a rank function being a polynomial, but um, wait, is it that? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the P kernel. Scratch what I just said. Okay. Um, yeah, no, the rank function is always an integer, gives an integer. Never mind. I don't know why I was thinking that. The P kernel's a polynomial, which is not then so far fetched. Um, but the definition of the P kernel for this guy is very different than the characteristic polynomial. So I guess I would just be surprised by that. 
Um, but for what it's worth, the poset structure in that case he uses is the face poset for um, the polytopes. And maybe the combinatorics there just works out to be the same. I'm not sure. I think kind of like uh, Mariel said, it would kind of require some understanding of what, how to like view the flats in the polytope <laughs> from the polytope perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be interesting to look into more. Are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, maybe I'll turn the recording off and I'll see if people had secret questions. 